Welcome back to another episode of The Political Life. Today, we are going to talk to you all about energy. We are going to speak to Amy Andrzak. Uh, Amy is the president of the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America, INGA. Hopefully, I got that acronym right. If not, Amy will correct me. We Natural gas is all the news. Uh, the lack of natural gas in certain parts of the country like New England and now Europe uh, in the world. Uh, and the natural gas prices are going up and everybody's talking about it. At one point, it was the bridge to the um, carbon-free future. And um, we'll have to learn all about it uh, from Amy. Uh, Amy, welcome to the show. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And so, um, Amy, I saw that um, in a letter in Utility Dive that you wrote earlier this year, you were talking about encouraging the Biden administration to signal to markets um, about the importance of natural gas and helping our country achieve um, our you know, security goals and uh, energy uh, independence. Um, what, um, what are you trying to, do you feel like we're not accomplishing um, that or there's more that we could do to make it easier? Uh, the natural gas industry that you represent? So that um, op-ed piece in Util Utility, Di Utility Dive was written right around the time when the Biden administration started calling for more LNG exports to help our friends and allies in Europe. And the point that I was making is we as an industry 100% agree with uh, having more LNG exports, but we have a problem in this country that there is not enough pipeline infrastructure to move gas from areas in the country where it's produced to those export facilities. And so there's only so much we can do as a country to increase our LNG exports around the world if we don't have enough infrastructure to move the gas around the country. And where are, when you think of those export terminals, um, is one um, up in Boston, in Massachusetts, where, where, where are they located? So primary export terminals are in uh, Louisiana and Texas. I mean, there are some others around the country, but those are where you really think of the bulk of the exports in the United States. The terminal in Boston right now is actually functioning as an import terminal, and it is importing LNG from around the country to help bring natural gas uh, to uh, consumers and electric generation in the Northeast. Because in the Northeast, they've seen a, um, uh, a huge um, increase in electric prices, which is driven by um uh, generators having to pay more for natural gas um, because I'm told that we're in a bit of a, a bottleneck in New England. Is that the case? Yes, very much so. I mean, and, and you're in Connecticut, so uh, you, I'm sure, know about this uh, firsthand as opposed to me sitting in Washington, but we have seen plenty of news. We've seen the governors of Northeast states write to the Secretary of Energy, concerned about what was going to happen this winter, anticipating that there would be fuel sh fuel shortages uh, in the Northeast, uh, very concerned about high gas prices, concerned about the potential for blackouts in the region. And the issue in the Northeast is that um, you have a lack of supply. There is not enough natural gas in the Northeast to both uh, provide the natural gas to consumers, which is done through your local distribution companies that facilitates the natural gas that goes into you know, your home, for example, um, for your stove, heating, et cetera. But then also you need additional natural gas for electricity generation, particularly during times of peak demand. And in the Northeast, 
you get these times of peace, peak demand when you have extreme cold weather and you just have more, you know, there's more demand on the system to increase uh, those overall heating, because obviously not all heating is done through, uh, is not done all through directly through natural gas. Some of it is electricity, heat pumps. And so you have more demand. And so, um, so in New England, we have a, a, uh, one way to solve that problem would be to expand uh, the pipeline capabilities uh, coming from areas such as Pennsylvania, correct? And I would assume- well, that- yeah, I mean that's our view that you you have you have a supply constraint not because we have a lack of supply in the United States. Actually, in the United States, natural gas is an abundant resource and um, there was a great statistic out from EIA which said that if we assume that we are going to produce natural gas in this country at the same rate that it was produced in 2020, then the United States actually has enough natural gas to last about 98 years. So we don't have an issue with um, with supply or availability. What we do have an issue is not enough infrastructure moving it around the country. And that's particularly true in the Northeast. You have an abundant resource in um, the Marcellus area, which is in that Appalachian region. And if you had natural gas pipelines moving gas from the Marcellus into the Northeast, you would have that additional supply, which would bring down these costs that the consumers in the Northeast are facing right now. And the political will has been, um, let's just say, not, um, you know, has has not um, been willing to do what it takes to get those pipeline that bottleneck taken care of. I mean, I know it's it's come up a number of times over the past ten years or so, um, and this you know this prediction of of spikes in natural gas was was you know people were warned, uh, and here we are. Um, you know, where um, do you think things will begin to change, and and the will will now be there to? I mean, I, I know I'm asking you to look into a crystal ball, but. You, you probably know better than anyone. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Unfortunately, my fear is that it's going to take something pretty disastrous to change the minds of those policymakers in the Northeast, because you are correct. A number of Northeast states have put forward fairly aggressive climate plans over the last few years. And... Uh, because those plans have different goals to um, to move their states off of any reliance on fossil fuels. Uh, they are unwilling to continue to invest in any additional infrastructure. Um, and so I, I think something dramatic is going to need to happen to sort of change their view. Now, I believe that uh, the facts are on the side of the need for more infrastructure. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you move to more renewables, renewables right now are an intermittent source of electricity generation. And until we have uh, abundant uh, battery storage capabilities to act as a backup, to those intermittent sources, the best backup to renewable sources of energy is natural gas because it is a fast ramping energy source to provide that electricity generation. Um, However, as you move to electrify uh, more items, you know, whether that's uh, appliances in your home or vehicles, it's going to increase the demand, the need for more electricity generation, which in turn means you're actually going to need more natural gas until you get renewables and battery storage at scale, which I think we're a long way from being there. Yeah. And as you said, it was, it's very interesting that when you think about using renewable sources such as solar and offshore wind or whatever it may be, 
you need something else to back that up if you're going to have reliability. And so you almost need more natural gas generation. Um, it's really quite interesting. I'm not sure a lot of people realize that, that with the more renewable energy you have, you actually need more um, uh, natural gas type generation. A- absolutely. And, and that's one of the things that you know, it's part of the mission of my association to try to educate people on that. We, my members aren't anti-renewable. Um, you know, we believe we have a role in supporting the build out of renewables. Um, mm-hmm. We are, you know, many of my member companies have, you know, made their own uh, climate commitments, but they view uh, they believe that natural gas is part of this long-term energy evolution, but uh, it does seem that there are some policymakers who are unwilling to accept that to actually reach their climate goals, they have to include natural gas in that equation. What are some of the um, uh, policy objectives that you're trying to achieve in Washington these days? Well, I mean, A number one is uh, trying to secure meaningful permitting reform. As you indicated, there's a lot of difficulty in building out new natural gas pipeline infrastructure. And uh, some of that is because of the way the the necessary statutes are written. Um, States do have a role in the overall permitting process. And we are seeing in some areas where uh, those state permits are being denied or delayed um, in what appears to be tactics by those states to not allow the infrastructure to ultimately be built. And you had mentioned that uh, we obviously have a a bottleneck in New England. Where else in the country are there um, similar bottlenecks? So, I mean, I think New England's a little unique in terms of how bad it is, sort of the bottleneck <laughs> that we're seeing. Um, but we are seeing certainly issues with reliability in California as well. I mean, California has experienced uh, rolling blackouts. Uh, California has, uh, on a temporary basis, brought back on uh, additional natural gas generation, even things that they've said we're going to phase out, then they kind of bring it back on to solve some of the reliability issues as they pop up. But I do think we're just, uh, I don't think we've seen the bottlenecks the way it's articulated, uh, like we've seen in the Northeast. But going back to a point we discussed earlier, as our country moves to bring more renewables online, which again, I think is a good thing, but you're going to continue to need that backup. And, um, and we need to ensure that there's enough infrastructure throughout the country to be able to continue to make sure that there is gas where it's needed ultimately by consumers and electricity generators. And, um, how long have you been, uh, at Inga? Um, I, just over two years. I started at Inga in September of 2020. And what were you doing just prior to this? So prior to joining Inga, I was doing government affairs work for a number of different businesses, including a natural gas pipeline company. And uh, how do you like working at and running an association? It. I've said this publicly. Um, it has been one of both the the greatest and most rewarding professional challenges I have had. Why do you say rewarding? Well, rewarding because I've learned so much in the last two years. I've spent my entire career really in the government affairs, advocacy, government policy space, getting to run. A trade association allows me to apply that knowledge and experience to an industry as a whole, but then I also have taken on um, the challenges of running a large organization, as you said, and working with a board of directors that's made up of executives of uh, some of the finest energy companies we have in the United States. 
what um, what part of the job do you enjoy the most? I'm sure you're interacting with the board and members quite a bit, interacting with the Hill, working on policy initiatives. Um, you seem like you, um, you must have to wear many hats. Which, uh, which hat do you find the most, uh, the most uh, enjoying, uh, enjoyable? Um, that may change based on the day, if I'm being perfectly <laughs> honest. Okay. Um, but yes, I wear many hats. Clearly, I enjoy working with lots of different types of people, right? Like you would not uh, thrive in a role like this because as you already articulated, it's it's very different uh, dealing with, you know, the CEO of a major energy business versus talking to a member of Congress uh, versus talking to a FERC commissioner or, um, you know, a different agency official. So I, I enjoy interacting with uh, many different types of people in different roles. That's that's just fun and natural to me. Um, and then also very much enjoy putting together the strategy of how we as an organization are going to try to advance our objectives on behalf of the industry. I mean, it's, it's, you know, like putting together an interesting puzzle. Well, and you, you know, you ran a congressional office on Capitol Hill. I would imagine that was some good training for what you're doing now. Well, and particularly when I was there, I, uh, I, when I talk about my time on the Hill, I'm always quick to note that I was there during the 2010 cycle, which was a particularly challenging cycle for moderate Democrats. And as you noted, I was chief of staff uh, to a, a moderate Democrat. Um, and that was tough. It was a, that was a, a tough time uh, politically. And um, as you look to the, the coming year, um, and again, I'm, I guess I'm asking you to pull out a crystal ball the coming year, does it look any any easier than the past year? I mean, obviously, we, we don't know what's going to happen with the war in Ukraine. Hopefully that that comes to an end. And um, but uh, as far as just in regards to your work, um, you indicated that the some of the changes you're looking for on Capitol Hill as, as you look to the year ahead. What else are you what else is on your your radar? Well, whether or not it's going to be. Um an easier year, I don't know. I think uh, we have a lot of, we're still going to work to further Inga's agenda. I am hopeful that we can see some bipartisanship on Capitol Hill, uh, particularly around uh, permitting reform, as I've already mentioned. Also, this is a year where um, FIMSA, which is one of the agencies Inga works most closely with, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Association, Safety Administration, uh, FIMSA, uh, their reauthorization is up this year. That's a legislative vehicle. Um, often termed the Pipeline Safety Reauthorization Bill is another way that it's affectionately titled. That's always uh, a key legislative vehicle that has impacts for our industry. So we'll be very engaged. And again, that don't need to be a bipartisan pro product um, with the divided government. And then, um, you know, the Biden administration over the last two years have initiated a number of different rulemakings that all have the potential to have impacts on different aspects of my members' businesses. And many of those rulemakings have gotten started, but now we're at the stage where we're waiting to see final regulations or the next step in the regulatory process. And so I anticipate that will keep um, keep us very busy over the next two years. And can, can you give us an example of um, some of the rulemaking changes that have taken place? So one that Inga will be heavily engaged with um, the Department of Homeland Security has announced a rulemaking uh, related to new cybersecurity regulations uh, that would impact uh, the pipeline industry. And um, this is sort of an extension of some of the work that we've seen out of DHS and TSA over the last two years. Um, after the Colonial Pipeline incident, uh, TSA issued uh, security directives 
which um, uh, were impacting the pipeline industry. And admittedly, when TSA uh, first put them out, they they were a bit reactionary. Uh, They didn't necessarily take in a lot of feedback from the industry in terms of um, you know, the potential effectiveness or workability of these, you know, directives that they were putting out. Um, but we had a, a really constructive process over the last two years, industry and the federal government working together to craft security directives that uh, would actually, you know, make sense and potentially help make pipelines more secure uh, against uh, cybersecurity incidents. And, um, but these directives, when they were issued, were short term directives, always with the intention that DHS would do a formal, um, would do a formal rulemaking uh, eventually. And that's what's happening now. And so that's an example of something that we'll be engaging with. And, you know, from our perspective, Uh, We want to make sure that whatever the final cybersecurity rules are that come come out from DHS, that they represent an outcome-based approach to security that really allows owners and operators to have more flexibility in implementing security measures that, you know, would align with a company's, um, you know, risk assessment and profile, for example. Uh, so, Amy, you uh, will have to give a shout out to you attended Penn State, right? Yes, I am a very proud Nittany Lion. Always happy to give a shout out. And um, do you, uh, does Inga offer internships? We, uh, we have a lot of younger listeners to the podcast and um, always looking for jobs. Do you have internships at Inga? So unfortunately, at this stage, I cannot announce that we have internships. It's something that we have discussed that maybe we uh, we should uh, take on a couple of summer interns. Uh, there is always more than enough work to do. Um, but I, I know that one of the goals of your podcast is to help inform folks who are um, earlier in their career in terms of how to engage in, you know, politics, government affairs, advocacy. And so I will say, even if it's not at Inga, if it's something that um, your listeners are interested in, I would highly encourage them, uh, whether it's moving to Washington for a summer or a semester, or even going to their local state capital and getting involved in state government. Um, It's a great way to really decide whether or not that's something they're interested in. And one of the things that I often chat with uh, sort of folks earlier in their career that say, I I think I want to work in government or I want to work in politics. Uh, Well, those are two different things. And so I think it's also important to decide what do you like? Do you, do you like the political side? Do you want to work on campaigns? Do you want to get engaged in, in political fundraising and advertising, or do you really like, you know, crafting policy? Do you really want to figure out how our laws and regulations in this country are written and be part of that process? Um, Because those are, are different paths that I've had the opportunity for them to intersect in my career. But that's not always the case. Some people decide to take one path or the other, and I think it's important to figure out what you enjoy. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a very good point because you can go, you know, you can go the political route, the campaign route. You can go, you know, work in journalism. You can work on the Hill or on policy. Um, yeah, it's a very, very good point. What was your first political or government experience? I had a fantastic first political experience, actually. Uh, in uh, 1999, I was hired to work on a political campaign. It was a race for the U.S. House of Representatives in Florida. And so I, I picked up, I left Washington, D.C. I moved to Miami, Florida. I knew absolutely no one. 
And I was the second person hired to work on a, on a campaign. Uh, my candidate, unfortunately, ultimately lost, um, but she lost by 589 votes, Oof. a number I will never forget. Wow. Um, but it put me in Florida in 2000, uh, which was a very exciting time uh, to be working on campaigns, for sure. Yeah, I'll say. Uh, boy. Well, that's great. And Amy, uh, we, we, we jumped right into it out of the box. Uh, I did not even give you a chance. Um, uh, can you please just tell our listeners a little bit about Inga, your mission, your members, kind of what you do? You're like, Jim, you started right in with a quote on an op-ed and, and people are like, what's Inga? So maybe we'll uh, maybe just tell people a little bit about your organization. Sorry about that. Absolutely. No, no, not a, not to worry. Uh, so again, INGA is the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America. We are the federally focused trade association representing interstate natural gas pipeline and storage companies here in the United States and Canada. We have 26 member companies and we represent, our members represent about 200,000 miles of interstate natural gas pipeline uh, that runs all over the country. Uh, it's primarily underground, so people are unaware. Um, but our members uh, have what are considered a larger diameter pipe, long haul pipe that moves gas across the country from where areas where it's produced to areas where it's gonna be used by end users. And our end users kind of fall into four main buckets of customers for our pipelines. You have local distribution companies. Those are the people that get the gas to actual you know, consumers in their homes and businesses. Um, you have electricity generation. So you know, gas um, power plants, for example. You have industrial manufacturers and then um, LNG export facilities. Those are sort of our four main buckets. So, Amy, uh, one last question before we wrap it up. Uh, if you know about what, um, how much of our electricity comes from natural gas generators? Absolutely. So currently about 40 percent, it's just shy of 40 percent of electricity generation in the country does come uh, from natural gas. I think um, your listeners may be surprised to know that uh, actually about 61 percent of all electricity generation is still coming from fossil fuels. So that would be a mix between coal, natural gas, petroleum, other uh, fuels. So um, even though, as we've discussed, this country is certainly moving towards renewables for more of our electricity generation, clearly there's still a long way to go. And I think this country is going to be reliant on natural gas for a long time in the foreseeable future. Well, Amy, it has been great to have you on. Uh, great to hear about your career and um, great to learn about Inga. And for our listeners out there, remember you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and you can sign up for our email. It comes out once a week at thepoliticallife.net. Amy, thank you so much for coming on. Jim, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Great. And for our listeners out there, we will see you in one week. <laughs>